thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I want to say thank you um, to the Iowa Arts Council, um, which is a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and Legacies for Iowa, uh, University of Iowa Museum of Art Collections Sharing Project, supported by the Matthew Buxbaum family. Um, all of these entities uh, really are generously supporting the Center for Afrofuturist Studies programming this fall, um, which we're very thankful for. I um, also want to give a shout out um, for donations from Decoder Magazine, E. Philos, and Joanne Swanson, which also supported this program. Um, I think Calmia Strong, um, for those of you I don't know, I'm the program director here at Public Space One, um, where Center for Afrofuturist Studies is housed. Um, and um, I want to tell you about, before I introduce Shawnee, um, I want to tell you about what we have coming up um, with CAS. Um, our next resident, Catherine Simone Reynolds, is arriving on Friday, um, right after Shawnee leaves. And um, she'll be here um, September 15th through the 28th, and she'll be giving an artist talk on Sunday, September 24th. Um, the next resident after that, next and final resident, is Jerry, Jade Ariana Fair, um, who will be here for six weeks, October 1st through November 15th. Um, she'll be doing a workshop on Saturday, October 14th, and also we'll have a uh, reception for an exhibition of the work that she does while she's here, um, probably in November, TBA. Um, Coming up at Public Space One in general, um, tomorrow morning, we open Disco Ball Supply Inc. Um, at Rad Inc., which is a pop-up space down on Washington Street, um, where you can come and buy local art and make homemade disco balls um, with me. I'll be there all week. Um, that's leading up to DIY VIP on Saturday night, which is a party for PS1 members. And I mention this largely because, um, despite all of the generous grant support that we get, um, this program um, is not possible without um, the support of our sustaining members who are people who, s who donate to Public Space One just a small amount every month. So if you think this program is awesome and would like to participate that way, um, you can talk to me afterwards um, and then come to the party on Saturday night. A um, couple other things we have coming up. Um, we are uh, co-presenting with KRUI a music show, David Dondero and Doug Nye at Trumpet Blossom on the 24th <coughs> after Catherine Reynolds uh, talk and um, we are going to be a screening site for the Creative Time Summit, um, which is themed of Homelands and Revolution on Friday, September 29th. So you'll be able to drop in all day and see live streams of the really awesome talks that will be um, presented through the Creative Time Summit. Um, finally, final logistic thing is, um, for those of you who were at Justin's talk, we have these nice little survey cards and this helps us um, get information about the program, get your feedback, um, and also do grant reporting. So if you can fill out one of these before you leave at the end of the night, we would really appreciate it. Okay, Shawnee, the reason that we're here. <laughs> um, Shawnee Michaelin Holloway um, is originally from a small town in Indiana, but currently lives in Chicago. Um, she has shown work and presented research internationally and nationally, as, um, including in France and Germany. Um, she is in addition to being an artist, she's also an educator and teaches on both art and sexuality. And she's currently a lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, as you probably already know, Shawnee is an internet artist who uses poetry, sound, still images, and video to create digital artifacts. Um, the theme of our residency this fall is ecologies. And Shawnee considers ecology um, through the lens of virtual environments and how we communicate, create identity, and are intimate with each other. And, a post-digital era. Um, with regard to Afrofuturism, she wrote to us, uh, working in a virtual space provides many ways for other populations to broaden their voices and harness the power to create images of ourselves that destabilize and reconstruct lopsided oppressive visions of the future. Um, I really want to thank, in addition to everyone else that I think, I want to thank Shawnee for being here, um, for generously um, sharing her time with the free workshop that happened right before this and for doing another workshop on Wednesday um, and for sharing her work with us tonight. First of all, that was a really lovely introduction. <laughs> I feel like I'm <laughs> flushing. Um, and also, like, it's really interesting to hear like what I had written like six weeks ago, and then now I've been here for three days and reconsidering like maybe how my work 
uh, is contextualized by Afrofuturism or not. Um, but also, there was one word in there that I that I, I guess had written. This is how like sort of dilated my time is. I guess in Doctor Who language, it would be like time. My time is timey wimey, and it does things and bubbles and cracks and breaks and all of these things. Um, but I, I said like maybe the virtual environment is like a one to explore uh, these images and representations of ourselves that we've built um, and like the intimacy that we can have with each other. That's interesting. I was talking to um, one of our lovely audience members, I will not call you out at the moment, um, but I was saying like, I don't understand intimacy. It's not something that like I ever really think about. Apparently I do think about it. Um, <laughs> apparently I thought about it at one time, um, but more so um, thinking about intimacy is like sort of a series of in, like people's subjectivities and interiorities kind of like butt up against each other and that may be creating this like energy um, which is something that I think I then translate into this space that we have kind of between us and the computer um, and that leads me to like I am a digital artist um, I well that's funny too because I I am very adamant in my last interview saying I'm not a digital artist <laughs> um, I, I also contradict myself a lot but for, for good reason because all of this language um, here that I've said today but also a lot of other languages always being redefined and that's something that I'm really adamant about um, especially as we go forth um, through technology redefining not only um, things as abstract as intimacy but things um, you know like categories that we we put ourselves in um, identi identities that have to evolve with language like digital arts <laughs> for example um, I in this last interview was like how dare you call me a digital artist? I'm not a digital artist, I'm a new media artist. Um, wait, hold on a second. Last year I said I was an internet artist. Um, but because, for example, um, digital arts really Im like imply this, this binary of like, well, if you're, not, if you're making digital art, you're clearly not making analog art. Um, but that's not true because like I'm totally here to like make some paintings <laughs> um, and I also like my original discipline was painting and then I decided that like you know I needed to learn a little bit about composition that was not 2D and I went and I did some sculpture and um, then I found new media out of that because I have a degree in political science and I was like sculpture doesn't do anything for me in my brain you know which is a lie now. I think I was like 18, you know, when I when I thought this, um, but I'm glad I did. My like little angsty 18 year old self was like, there's something more out there. And what can I, what can I do to like find that and feel that, right? Um, and I think something that I did respond to and whatever words my self six weeks ago had put down on that paper was that there is something more, um, a deeper thing that we can find within these internet technologies or really even further networked technologies because there is a difference between the internet which is a series of connected computers um, through cables and other technology and the world wide web which is a series of web pages linked together by uniform resource locators or urls which are the last bit of code mind you that we all seem to really have to interact with on a daily basis um, but that, that, you know, all of these networks in, in succession have something that they're doing to, like, I don't know, bring out this kind of societal subject, inner subjectivity that is, like, spewed all over everywhere, whether that's, like, extending to, like, bus signs, signs on buses, or, like, you know, um, our, our, like, portable computers that we have in our pocket that our faces are, like, always glued to. Um, there's something there that connects us in, in a way that is profound that like escapes our language, um, which is also why I don't necessarily call myself a digital artist because like that poetic thing that we feel through that connectivity is not like digital per se that like originates somewhere else that might like be in your stomach or like in your brain or in your armpit or like maybe in like your crotch area I don't know you know <laughs> and just like there's something deeper than that um and the thing that I think really connects us the most in in these different um networks are the images that we see um a lot of what I'm going to say workshop participants is probably like double for you guys um because we just spent two hours um really destructing or deconstructing um and destructing maybe perhaps what these images are, whether they're printed on a piece of paper or they're showing up on our phones, um, what is the material, materiality of these, um, of these images? 
uh, and before I get into that too, I'll say a little bit more about myself as an artist. A lot of my work is extremely um, like XXX. It's like very explicit. Like my ass is on the internet, you know, like my boobs are on the internet. <laughs> um, I had um, in the beginning of my career, I had a whole series about being a cam girl and all the things that I did as a cam girl or a cam dominatrix um, or any number of different things that I appeared on the internet. So if you've looked me up, that's majority of what I probably come up as. Um, a couple years ago, I was invited to the new museum for a panel slash conference called Open Score Art and Technology in connection with Rhizome. And um, they, a few days before they were like, hey, like, can you like send us an image of your work? And I was like, sure, that sounds great. And I um, sent them a picture of a blank browser window. I do this thing where like I really love to take screenshots of my images within browser windows. And it's great because what that does is it like dates all of the stuff that I do. So like, you'll see like Safari circa like 2011, which is totally ugly now, I hate it. But you know, it's there and that's a signature of some kind. Um, or now like I switch to Chrome's and Chrome and all my like weird, you know, not weird, lovely fan folk who will like totally know that. Um, I'm also a weird, lovely fan folk of other people. So like, that's no judgment on anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but I submitted this like blank browser window and they were like WTF. I used this, yeah, they totally were, because they're, you know, I think, I, I don't think it's going out, a, out on a limb to say, like, they were expecting pictures of me in, like, particularly compromising positions, and that's just, like, not what I was about to show up to, like, New York City for the first time ever in my whole entire adult life, like, at a museum <coughs> institution that I was like completely terrified of and whatever else like to go put on a screen and that's no judgment on people who do want to do that it was just like not what I had on my agenda probably also because I was already having a panic attack on stage I don't think you can notice I'm like flipping invisible hair that I don't have because I was very proud of myself for keeping it together um because it's also like a very vulnerable part um, of my career too it was me, me being like oh hi it's my coming out party you know um but for me, um, the reason why I didn't want to show this was because that's like, n like these explicit things are the things that I fill my research with and I express myself um, through. And my research at that point was in browser studies. So it was like, you know, what happened in the browser wars of like the 1990s and how do we feel that? Um, that trajectory today. It was how do we interact with a browser in a meaningful way? How do we, um, you know, how do we feel like clicking the back button? You know, does it how like what does that do to our physical bodies? Where do where does the oh shit like I accidentally hit that weird side button on our mouse thing and now I just like wasted twenty minutes of typing actually live in our bodies? You know that kind of stuff, um, and. So that's why I did that. And then I talked for a really long time, probably way more than I should have, um, about why I didn't like um, use that. I also blanked. Like, This person asked me a question in front of thousands of people. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but since then, um, I've done like a lot of measures to, to really, when I get this opportunity to like talk to a bunch of people, like D. Technology, 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 blah, 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 blah. yeah, <laughs> D digital, <laughs> my um, my talks because this is what I want you to interact with. The person that you see online is like here somewhere, but it's not necessarily who is the one like writing hundreds of pages of like whatever the hell this is. Um, I've also started writing letters to all of the. Um, audiences uh, that will see my new work. And I did this um, lastly. I performed one of these letters, um, which I will be reading to you after asking you some questions, which I hope you will talk, you will answer for me, um, was at Conversations at the Edge at School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And it was sort of in the form of like a multimedia sound um, interactive thing where I presented also a bunch of videos. But because I'm here doing this work for the first time, which is really, really special at this residency, um, I don't have the work necessarily with me. And the workshop was a, a way to kind of invite people to uh, into my process. Um, and I mentioned this because 
a lot of the work that I do do is very XXX and can definitely alienate people from the start. They're like, oh my God, boobs, I gotta go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially like digital arts audiences, this is not something that everybody is comfortable with. I myself talk about buttholes every day because that's what my job asks me to do. I am a sexuality educator with um, a large uh, retail chain across the, the country and have been since I was 18 years old on and off. Um, ran away to, to Europe for a few years, but I came back and I'm still talking about buttholes. And, um, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to de-butthole uh, tonight as much as possible. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do, and we did this in, in the workshop too before I start talking, because this letter really just like dives in, um, in into the meat of what, what I'm talking about, is um, just, you know, sort of preface also by saying we're going to talk about the, the, the connections um, and like the haptic sort of experiences that, that we have with these images that circulate online and, and through other media. But uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the, you guys to maybe provide me a little bit with um, your conception of what uh, a photograph is. So what's a photograph to you? Don't answer at once. Clearly, no time. A record of light and shadow. Cool, thank you. So a photograph can be a record of light and shadow. What else can a photograph be? Or what comes to mind when you think photograph? Because not everybody also thinks that, I mean, when I'm scrolling through IG, I'm not sure that I'm thinking of light and shadow, even though light and shadow are the only thing that is like in my face at the moment. <laughs> I've been a person who, when they entered the room, they would take six pictures, they'd come halfway in, they'd take six again, they'd sit down, and they took six. So, um, a re like a record of an experience, too? I feel it helped them negotiate their life. I yeah. Don't know for sure, but. So, oh. um, a photograph is an as as an action, as yes. a way to ori yes. orient mm -hmm. our bodies and and ways of seeing. And I don't know if they were ever translated into being present <laughs> or not. I don't know, but if it's just an action or a the if it's if it's if the important part is the action, the translation of that photograph doesn't really matter. It's just about the action of taking that photograph, or a performance as an action or a performance. What else is a photograph? So, um, uh, an uh, apparatus to stimulate organic stuff. I don't know who said that because I was looking at you. Yeah, hi. <laughs> cool. To stimulate. Um, is that organic stuff like life or is it like can photographs impact like other kinds of life, like other kinds, you know, assuming that life is only human, guys, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah, cool. Can um, photographs be other things? I think of a photograph as something physical that you can hold in your hand. What kind of physical thing? Say more about that physical, well, this physicality. Like paper with a glossy surface. So a paper thing. Yeah. Um, does that paper thing have to have anything particular on top of it to make it a photograph, or is it just yeah, that it paper has to thing? Have a black and white. Okay. We're getting there. What else? Picture of a stop time. Mm -hmm. 
or even a method to stop time? A record or a method? Anything else? I would um, distinguish a photograph from like a still of a moving picture. Like a, if you po press pause on a movie, I wouldn't call that a photograph. So maybe there's something of the intention behind taking it. Mm -hmm. What makes a photograph or a painting of the same thing different? Other than it's like maybe one person, a person, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm answering my own question already, but you know, what's the, what's the difference? Because you can paint with ink, right? And you also have to see uh, light and dark and not light and color and I mean color is light as well to be able to perceive a painting so what's the difference between a painting and um, I think that people uh, think a photograph is true and a painting is a story or made up ah. who, who, who feels that is a kind of like a, a socially sort of like constructed thing that's yeah uh, yeah cool yeah great answer um, yeah, so like a photo is actually a document, yeah, um, and a painting is an act of like creation, yeah. What's the difference, um, what would you call a photograph an image and also a painting an image? Yeah. And then do you have any thoughts about these things being translated into digital environments? Are you, do you relate to these things differently in digital environments? I think the photograph feels a lot more accessible. Like we all have, for instance, have the computers that we carry with us, but we now have these capabilities that it holds, it's like a DSLR camera would have been in the 90s. So now everyone can have an Instagram, but there is no sort of the equivalent Pinterest app about, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Like this translation of like these medias to like somehow legitimize like a digital thing or like create these like tingles of nostalgia and these different things. Yeah. Um and how long do you spend with images and photographs and paintings and things? When's the last time you spent time with one of these things? Whether you're the maker or the viewer, we're probably. Yeah, we had the, I asked the same question in the workshop, and somebody said, um, I spend lots of time taking photographs, but I never actually look at them. You know, I've got thousands of these things on my computer, and I'm like, I don't even know what half, half of them look like. But when's the last time you spent significant time with an image? We just gotta have one person give a testimonial. You know. How do you define significant? Yeah. More than like, like, or LOL. Because <laughs> that's actually, it could be significant as well. I think um, there are, there's a lot of really extensive work done with memes. Um, that are these things that are meant to be like seen and then not seen again or you know also like that build these types they build so i, I don't know about you but the, as the more and more i see the spongebob meme in like different incarnations the the more it like becomes part of me and the more like i actually laugh like with my physical body and not just lol and put my phone down yeah it's a thing um so what we did in this workshop before was we translated these images. Um, we all brought we all brought a photograph, whether that was a printed something that was animated, something that was um, you know something that was special to us that might have previously been in like a cameo or something uh, where we stared at it and was like, oh my lover, I miss you, you know. <laughs> um, to uh, like a photo booth picture, we all brought these in and we stared at them for 15 whole minutes. <laughs> It's like a long time. That's like, 
I took a shower <laughs> in this time, you know. And um, then we deconstructed them. And I think that this deconstruction is super important. Um, this is also something that I'm doing in my um, in my practice to kind of like get to know sort of the, the ways in which computers also deconstruct images. Um, the way that computers do this, because um, they're already, you know, everything in a computer is seriously just like a series of zero one zero one zero one one one. Um, and these deconstructions of all these images, uh, software programs into 0010111 are then put through other rules and encodings, depending on which environment you're in, into other shapes and words and um, sentences and codecs and all these other things, some of which are proprietary, which means um, they can't be like interchanged into uh, like one software program or the other. Um, and some of them are open source, which means everybody can access them and get inside and, and sort of like uh, rearrange them. Um, but they are all built by somebody. Um, they are built by engineers. Um, they are essentially sprung from a system of networks that was created to support governmental activities which like is, it feels that that knowledge, the fact that I'm especially creating like f as like an internet artist or as a new media artist or a digital artist, whatever I wanna wake up with that day, um, that like feels weird sitting in my body. Um, and one of the things that I'm making an effort to do is to like get out of that environment to see what it feels like to not create within these like governmental structures and in no way <laughs> this is my biggest fear is like oh you're di you're you're a digital artist and you're like going the other way you must think that the internet is bad now all digital art you know y'all sell out at some point and you know go sort of the um the internet is alienating us sort of route that's my biggest fear that people will think that about me it's like really not true um but what it is is like trying to relate to the material that I'm making for the screen and really feel it and embody it. And sometimes in order to do that, like moving away and, and sort of like going back to the foundations of where that media comes from, how it's built um, from the bottom up, whether that's, you know, the first sort of like technology being like language or whatever, um, and, and coming back to this, this digital thing that's happening. Um, and I, I'm going back to painting with this new work. Um, but how can I take others through um, and myself deconstruct images into things that are not zeros and ones, but feel as rudimentary in form as the zeros and ones are to a computer environment? Um, and I'm a super fan of like structure, which is why I study browsers, <laughs> you know, these interfaces um, and deconstructions all have, they all have political implications that come out of it. Um, like I mentioned before, the browser wars of the 90s when, like, you know, uh, Internet Explorer, like, won over Netscape, and when Netscape died and Opera, like, also died, but, like, Erwise was still kind of hanging in there. This is the wrong timeline, by the way. I'm very, like, you know, just riffing. But, um, you know, when, when the home button was added, when the um, forwards, like, who uses the forwards button very often anymore? And it's, like, taken out. Um, but, you know, there's like bits and pieces of all these interfaces that have like come in and out of, of the images that we actually see that function and um, sort of function upon us and like create, like I said, that, like that these feelings, whether that's from like, oops, I hit that weird mouse button <laughs> um, to, uh, you know, what does it mean to be home? on the internet, that's a whole project. That might be fun, also depressing, because I don't know what it is to be home on the internet anymore. Certainly not my Facebook page, um, even though I know for some it is home. But, you know, looking at the code underneath these things that disappear and come up and are pictured and so fixed um, in, in, in us, and how can we have meaningful experiences with those? Um, so I wrote, I wrote a long thing, and I'm gonna read it. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope this is something that you can connect to in one way or another. Um, and after this, if you have questions, I would really love to hear them. Um, this is a proposal of sorts. <coughs> um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna stop.
talking and read. Dear viewer, the importance of reframing and deconstructing meaning is inextricably tied to the relationship that media has to A, its content, and B, we have to that content's material. This colors, for better or for worse, the relationships we have uh, with its content in return ourselves. The perception of preciousness we have or perhaps once had as a society with the photograph or the image otherwise mediated tends to su supersede the underlying implication of the object itself. Um, and this can also extend to the content within the object itself. Digitally speaking, we form relationships with a series of numbers, letters, and symbols that have been encoded by operating systems created by men, many working for government agencies. Our media abides by standards that have nothing to do with the experimental nature of an image and how we have created it. Photographs printed on paper come closer to being able to give an experimental or experiential interaction with an image. However, the printed image is just a polit as politically charged. Um, <coughs> Sorry. By turning itself into a fetish object, the printed image, via the perception of preciousness, we attach our bodies to it always as an, as an object and orient them toward the same place where the photo or fetish object also must be oriented. There is no movement here. The relationship between the photo object and our two eyes have always, are always solidified. There are no connections that can be made to any other sense, save for a basic transaction through touching, however, a non-complex touching, since photographs are flat. What the translation process does is envision a multi-layered or complex touching. This kind of touching can appeal to the senses through a multitude of per perspectives. The senses that are touched also go deeper in some uh, than in others and are intertwined amongst memories and attached to those senses. In trying to incorporate haptic communication with digital technology, we generally see conversations from around virtual reality or form around virtual reality and augmented reality. I want to challenge this default and present the idea that haptic feedback can come in the form that feeds the intellectual and spiritual body. In the early texts written by digital humanities scholars, these spiritual experiences were legitimized and thought of as purpose and potential, or as the purpose and potential for the new digital language and environment. Their futures, these scholars, we're more complex than ours actually are. <coughs> oh my gosh, I didn't think I would like start like having a coughing fit. <coughs> this one. <coughs> but I'm so sorry. <coughs> Centering predominantly on architecture, a generally tangible discipline, a tangible meaning like perhaps physical, <coughs> they cited that this new space inhabited by a media was a playground for the soul or Oh my gosh, I might have to have somebody read this for me. <coughs> Actually, would someone like to read this? <coughs> I'm really <coughs> sorry, I don't think I can do it. <coughs> I have some first for <coughs> I think I'm like gonna have to take you a little bit. Honestly, <coughs> maybe this will work. No, I like, can't like actually get my words out. I've been sick for like the past week with like I don't know allergies or something. Really, I'm like, I promise I will like compensate you for your time. <laughs> no labor should go free. <coughs> oh my God! Wait, okay, let me try one more time. This might actually help. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm going to reread that really quick. Therefore, their futures were much more complex than ours. Centering predominantly on architecture, a generally tangible discipline, they cited that this new space inhabited by a media was a playground for the soul or alternatively for subjectivity. In 1991, Marcos Novak, a self-described trans architect, 
um, developed his understanding of liquid architecture. Liquid architecture is an architecture that breathes, pulses, leaps as one form and lands as another, whose, whose form is uh, content on the interests of the beholder. It is an architecture that opens to welcome me and closes to defend me. It is an architecture without doors or hallways, where the next room is always where I need it to be and where it needs to be. He later emphasizes that we enter this space, therefore we touch it and it touches us. There, in this fluidity, we, can, we find objects that are always already covered by our presence there. To understand them, we must have a double consciousness of their structure and their meaning. Novak proposes the way to do this is through restoring poetry to science. Because if science is a process of practicality and intellectually studying the behavior and structure of something through observation and experiments, any moment we take a look at an image, we perform science and are touched by this poetry that has been long forgotten in this discipline. I think I'm going to survive, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that sa same essay, Liquid Architectures in Cyberspace, that's what the essay is called, Marcos Novak's, Novak looks at poetry as the intelligible incarnation of the unnameable. So I'm imagining this unnameableness as that space that I was talking about that like we inhabit when we sort of delve into the experiencing of this like image. He draws upon the work of Federico Garcia Lorca, a poet, playwright, and theater director from the early 20th century, and suggests that to read poems, we must invoke a kind of spirit, the duende, um, which is also known as a demon, <clears throat> a demon spirit. And I, I don't know the, um, the per like, precise implications of that word to really talk more about like why it's a demon, um, but I think that's really interesting and something to maybe think on. To make comprehensible uh, poetic poetic facts, which again is this like sort of unnameable thing that um, Novak was getting at. This duende stands in connecting the impossible existence of the meaning of a thing, for example, the outlandish outcome of an experiment, and connects it to its already being. <clears throat> so like these sort of abstract um, spaces that we enter into that kind of need like a vessel for us to be able to swallow. Um, this is this like duende is the thing that connects us to it in a way that we can suspend our belief. <coughs> Excuse me. Or to its own existence that gives us light and life regardless of journeys our minds have to take to get to it and an acknowledgement of its real and tangible existence. This freeing of language from one-to-one -one correspondence and the parallel invocation of a demon spirit that permits access to meaning that are beyond common knowledge, normal language, permits us to produce some of the most powerful poetry ever written. This could be extended to some of the most influential experiments ever made or some of the most embodied learning we've ever done. These images and how we interact, or rather touch them, and how they touch us going forward, lay the foundations on which we will develop new technologies um, organically, culturally. Um, <clears throat> we are overrun by capitalist agendas and other multi-billion dollar corporations looking to create the perfect communicative capitalistic industry they can. Poetics do not have a space there. This industry rests on the revenue from linked data or data born of relationships. Your images assume they are, or the, I guess, linked data. Like data is the basic way to define that. It's like when you are on Facebook and like someone says, this is my hometown, and then you click on that hometown, and all the people that like have cited that as their hometown um, will like pop up essentially and then that hometown is like well this is a sister city of this other town and then this other town has a whole list of people from that so this is how that linked data functions um 
but our images um, are indexed and they digitally produce this linked data. So another way to, to like see this embodied and inhabited is through like facial recognition and like then once you have facial recognition and your face runs through like all these different engines saying that this person with this type of nose or this uh, color of skin or this like, you know, your eyes are set this far apart, whatever goes into a huge database and all these different datas and things are sent out and being bought and sold by all these companies. Um, but by concentrating on uh, creating our own systems of deconstructing, deconstructing media, we are orienting ourselves. So, <coughs> excuse me, using science to create our systems um, of deconstruction, which is what we were doing in this photo, or this workshop right before this this letter. Uh, we are orienting ourselves to work inside of these communicative capitalist systems. More and more images will begin to be converted into systems with even heavier political um, architectures, like virtual reality and augmented reality. I say this because, you know, the most accessible version of um, augmented reality uh, is through apps. The most accessible version of virtual reality is through, like, Google Cardboard. And Google is the same person who's ostensibly like supporting these structures of communicative capitalism. And I define communicative capitalism as, um, you know, I guess any sort of like millennial marketing strategies. These like uh, the perception of like give and take, like what you put in, you you get out, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is what our, our market is like beginning to rely on. Um, <clears throat> More and more of these images will begin to be converted into systems with even heavier political architectures like virtual reality and augmented reality. We move out of our um, art and cultures blindly towards these platforms um, without yet doing the work to maximize our critical understandings of mediated infrastructures <coughs> as we have access to it now. So I'm saying that also as a person who studies the browser, like before, in my opinion, <laughs> before we get to these other structures like augmented reality and virtual reality, we have to understand what this browser has brought to us. And I don't think that that's something that we, um, we do when we log on because these browsers be have become a vehicle um, for us to communicate only, um, but not necessarily like do any kind of like embodied performance or recollection or like um, memory making or even myth making um, within. Uh, the other steps VR and AR uh, take are to leave behind um, the body while investigating images. I see this as a mistake and inherently unpoetic. What it does, or it does not suspend my belief, but at once wipes away everything from me underneath me and as well as chop off my feet at the ankle alongside it. Um, though, you know, and I say this because a lot of people like have somebody at the party the other day was saying like, I can't do VR because what it does is it just makes me puke. Like it doesn't like assimilate with my body at all because we don't have this like learned perception of like what it is to deal with that environment yet, which is, is I think it's fine to like explore these technologies. But if we're really trying to have embodied poetic experiences, this sort of technology isn't necessarily accessible for everybody as we know it. Um, and you really do, you lose like all sense of like where up is, where down is. And that, you know, you can see on like Instagram and things, um, people sort of like blindly kind of walking into walls, you know? Um, and that to me is not poetic. It's like something else. I'm not sure. Um, and I haven't done the work to really put language to what that something else is. But the work of di digging deeper is paramount. The rewards are couched in the satisfaction of discovery and consumption. The richness of images is only discovered through labor and surrender. What we find in them will lead to a surrender uh, and work of a different kind. But until we understand critically the ways in which we touch media, <clears throat> as it is right now, and it touches us in whatever the most prominent form it is of the times, we cannot move forward through to the next. In the 1960s, Ted Nelson inv invented a system of browsing the internet called Xanadu. 
Nowadays, it looks much like a 3D game space, except this browser um, functioned in a real-time editing system, which is something that most browsers in the 90s and, like, I guess not 2000s, but in the early 90s, had. So this, um, the World Wide Web was just conceived of a bunch of pages that everybody could contribute to. Um, uh, it also like pictured linked data in these like very like 3D ways, um, visualized in 3D space. Images were combined to also be a part of this space. His goal was to deviate from the 3D or the 2D paper model that had been existing in operating systems, software applications, and web browsers. Um, so you know, MS Paint is like mimicking Paint, which we talked about earlier with these new apps and these kinds of things. It's still kind of defaulted. Microsoft Word, talking about what it meant to like write words in the document on a page. Um, Ted Nelson also wanted to look beyond the architectures of consuming media um, to extract relationships uh, between content in a more visual, sonic, and embodied way. The browser wars of the 90s prevented his Xanadu to actually run. And then, like, he's still pictured today on YouTube, like, looking at this um, and <clears throat> trying to, like, make this, make Xanadu happen, which I kind of, I really, like, hope it happens <laughs> someday. And it kind of has, I guess, with VR, but that VR apparatus is something that I think is standing in the way. I'm not sure what he would say about that. Uh, but for me, this is, uh, for me, but I'm moving away from that. The understanding of Afro features and that I've always subscribed to uh, is a field where we are doing the work to decolonize existing infrastructure uh, and architecture and either um, reclaim a structure that was there before or to build an entirely new one. Because uh, early black thought existed in a quite sophisticated form, of course. Um, incorporating... Um, much more than um, this like logic of science, including religious practice and other spiritual like sort of subjective things. Uh, this project is an effort to swing back around to that methodology. So incorporating things that are not just, you know, how can we like go from point A to point B logical and these logical steps based on all the things that we know. How can we incorporate things that we know from nature, from the ground, from um, our oral traditions, from our community traditions, all of these things. Um, I think in terms of cyberspace, but these analyses can be um, invoked across media and other disciplines. The first time I fully understood this and how my work uh, interacts with sort of an Afrofuturist agenda um, was watching Rashida Phillips talk about nonlinear concessions of time in relationship to an Afrohistoric perception or creation of time and the Euro, sort of comparing it with the Euro Christian or Catholicized uh, conception of time as it exists now based on different religious structures um, and the way that like calendars work and all these other things. Thinking of <clears throat> things even further still in connection to other um, histories like Max Weber and his examination of the Protestant work, work ethic and how they directly contributed to the rise of capitalism and its colonization of every day and everything <laughs> now. Um, these, you know, these histories were sort of like usurped, these Afro histories were usurped and redirected by a colonizing force and I'm trying to like revisit these like more su subjective or at least individualized structures of, of seeing and of like organizing and sciencing, I guess, um, the world. Uh, the project I am working on now re-envisions systems much like that, um, much like the process that I took others through uh, during the uh, workshop to deconstruct images. Um, this project is sort of a reverse engineering of that, I mean, this project meaning the thing that I'm working on here. Um, it's an embodied practice um, into a static form, so I'm painting and these other things. Uh, and these static forms are to become total or totems and um, ultimately uh, fetish objects, things to be worshipped and things to be coveted. This time, a fetish object made of a fetish performance to become a gesture of fetishistic desire and reflection. This series is, is going to be called Chamber Series. This work is a reimagining of a moment of performance in which I, engaging with myself in an act of sadomasochism, am exploring my own desires. I have set out to create a system in which this playtime can be recorded, visualized, mapped, gazed at, coveted, and held. It, function as a, it functions as a tool of memory. Uh, 
the one th the one thing the one hazard is you can't read your own writing sometimes <laughs> evidence um and reflection a few other things oh instruction and reflection i'm translating something once embodied into print on paper for it then to be uh, eligible for the same translation process that we talked about uh, in the in the workshop so sort of making the images to sort of exist in these different mediums to then be reconstructed and reperformed and sort of adding to this like milieu of 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 science, sciencing things. Um, so often acts of sadomasochism and other vulnerable uh, intimate spaces are hidden. I look to turn them outwards to audiences so they may be consumed much like poetry because they feel like poetry. I am turning subjectivity into a science to then re, uh, re restore that poetry back to science, eventually translating them from an online to an online environment that will give them a whole completely separate type of animism. Um, until then, I look to drawing and painting to create these images on four panels. I will create scores much like those of classical musicians to annotate uh, this performance. To a company, there will also be a key. This key will be shared as an individual work in itself, evidence of the translation uh, that will not be hidden. For years, composers have created what is known as graphic notation, which has allowed performers who are not classically trained to perform or appreciate the process uh, of the construction of music. My project is in their tradition, a tradition of looking below, looking inside, uh, externalizing this something tightly, um, tightly regulated, and a tradition of trying to create something beautiful or pleasurable even. Is ending of my life. <coughs> and, you know. So this is this is what I will go forth now and do. Um, and I thank you all for like coming and thinking through these um, these different mediums with me because it's really regular. This stuff is regular, but I hope that that's one thing that I that you you take from this, um, is that my you know there there are structures of power and histories embedded in literally everything that we look at, um, and that shouldn't have to also be oppressive. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be like looking at like a Robert E. Lee statue in a park all the time, but it can <laughs> you know it can feel like that um at times but that these things are all um these like these structures and architectures are all opportunities also for um recreating them um because like i said in the beginning like these structures were made by like one guy and now that one guy can be you <laughs> in a certain way um and the and the also finding these new sciences are it's a it's a form of like creating other oral traditions or making new like folk traditions um and that these folk traditions are very similar to the like creating new new worlds you know new myth making um it's something that we do every time we open a computer we add to the new myth that is whatever the internet is at that moment um but that there can be like regulation to that uh, that can make a real impact. So, yeah. That's my thing, guys. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> and also, I think the person who left that offered, like, yeah, I could read that. Like, thank you. Documentation, <laughs> really, you know, number one <laughs> over here. Um, thanks for, like, sitting through that moment of distress with me. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs>